welcome to all of you who are listening in. We hope to uh, take you through a lot of uh, interesting and nuts and bolts of the insurance on the local church level. But we want to get you started with the uh, kind of some of the assumptions and some of the legal premises that are involved here. Uh, we're not going to spend all day talking on this particular issue, but it helps you to set the tone for the discussions that we're going to have. Uh, first of all, we need to look at the local church relationship to the conference. The local church by church polity is not a separate legal entity. What I mean by that is, is that the Seventh-day Adventist Church has chosen through its policies and through the decisions of the world body that we consider the local church to be part of the conference and not a separate legal uh, organization separate and apart from the conference. What that means is, is that in basic uh, pure English, it just means that the conference is the lowest legal entity that the church defines. Now, could that be different? Yes. And so I, I simply guide you and, and suggest that when you're, if you're talking to local council who are not familiar with the Adventist church, that you let them know that because it's very important. A local church could be deemed an unincorporated association, which is a separate legal body. But if you ever got into a circumstance in a court case or something like that, and then the general conference and the North American division working policy were put into evidence, you'd soon find that the local courts would be looking at the conference for those liability points. So keep in mind that uh, there's a, a few things that you need to be aware of. Because of that situation, the actions of your local church board and your employees and volunteers may actually bind the conference. And that comes through actual or apparent authority. What that simply means is, for example, when the conference, when the pastor of the church says he's going to sign something on behalf of the church, he has apparent or actual authority, depending on whether it was actually voted or apparent, whether it looks like he's got it, because if he looks like he's got the authority and it's on good basis, he's probably binding the local conference to whatever actions he's taking. And you'd have a hard time saying, no, nah, he doesn't. He didn't represent us because he's on your payroll. Uh, he is an employee and therefore he can act and create authority and create a liability for you. So local actions can and do have direct legal impact on the conference. So let's take another look at what ties some of that together. The conference holds title to the real estate. So the local church actually doesn't own the real estate. The local conference owns the real estate, usually through its association, although in North America, a lot of the conferences have merged the association and the unincorporated body and just have one. The local conference sets the policies, uh, albeit they have to be in line with NAD policy and GC policy. Uh, Again, with the, and I know some people don't really like this, but because of the way we've set up the church uh, through the world program, the conference is the employer of all the staff. Since the conference is the lowest level legal authority in the church, even if the local church pastor or the local school board or the local church board hires a teacher, legally that, uh, that employee is an employee of the conference. And of course, the conference provides spiritual leadership, pr provides support for various ministries uh, that happen at the local church. Tim, what does the conference do? Yeah, as Bob described, there is apparent and actual authority given by the conference to the local church and the pastor and the volunteers to do certain things. The local church obviously has the authority to choose volunteers for ministry. Um, they determine the church membership. They determine the church discipline issues within the policies of the guidelines that the conference has put out. Um, these things can lead to liability back into the conference. As Bob described, as they are not a legal separate organization, if a, if a local church does not do um, good practices in volunteer screening and those types of things, and a volunteer does something that causes bodily injury or injury to somebody on our premises, the lawsuit will name the conference as in the lawsuit. So it's when we get into it, a lot of local churches will want to go buy a policy that only names the church. But the church really doesn't have any insurable interest in the activities. It gets tied back to the conference. 
Um, so with that in mind, we want to move into how the local entities expose the conference even a little bit more. Liability at the local church arises through, through back to the conference through behavior at that local church. Um, as you know, the North American Division has said that all volunteers working with children need to have a background check. They need to be through the volunteer screening. If by behavior and then through policy, a local church doesn't follow that, that can fall back onto the conference. The legal structure, Bob talked about that. The legal structure that says the conference is the, lo the lowest legal entity defines who owns the property, who is responsible for the actions at the local church, and can come back up to the conference. Behavior or knowledge of employees or agents. Um, as, as we said, the conference is the lowest employer, but volunteers and pastors at the local level have authority, whether it's implied or given to them, to make to do transactions on behalf of that local church, which really can be a transaction on behalf of the conference. Um, one of the areas we run into a lot of times is we're asked to review leases or um, those types of contracts. And a lot of times we've run into where a local pastor or a volunteer in all good faith has signed a lease or the use of some equipment on behalf of the local church. It hasn't been reviewed by an attorney. And that transaction, if it's not done correctly, can hold the conference liable. Um, I recall one case we had where a church had entered into an agreement to lease their parking lot to a local business to use it during the week, you know, weekdays. A great opportunity for a little income and support the community, um, but the contract didn't have an end date on it. And so when the local church decided, hey, we want to stop leasing our, our parking lot out, it became a real issue and the conference got involved and had, you know, there was some liability issues because it was a poorly written contract. The pastor had entered in this in good faith, but the conference is the one who had to work through their attorneys and, and pay the legal fees to, to remedy that situation. Let me take you through a few more examples because I think uh, those kind of things really help to, to kind of put the picture in place. Selecting unsuitable volunteers. We see this all the time in conference situations where a local church may for whatever reason decide they don't want to follow the normal guidelines for screening uh, volunteers. Uh, we've even had situations where somebody who has been involved in sexual molestation in the past uh, has now become active in a local church. And I understand the concept of forgiveness, but at the same time, when you forgive, that doesn't mean you have to, you should forget. And uh, unfortunately, uh, recidivism in the issue of child abuse is, is a real problem. And, and so you'll find a person who has had a child abuse problem and suddenly they're back very active in the church. And if there's an abuse situation that arises, that liability is going to flow straight to the conference because the conference, again, is the legal entity in which the courts would allow the liability to be uh, to be. Uh, given. Uh, failing to supervise volunteers is very similar to that, and frankly, that's where we get most of our child uh, abuse cases in, in recent days. We get a lot of cases now of child-on-child -child sexual abuse. Uh, that That's kind of almost a predominant trend that's coming up these days, and that all comes down to failing to supervise volunteers properly. So let's say, for example, you've got a Pathfinder outing and you end up with a case of child on child sex abuse and you prove or they prove in a court that there was not proper supervision for those kids. Uh, that liability, again, can flow right into the conference office because the conference will be the named entity. Maintenance and selection of vehicles is also very critical. Uh, we've seen here recently, we have a case right now which uh, involves uh, a, the bad selection of vehicles. It was not maintained properly. Uh, we we're talking about a van that, that uh, should never have been on the road. It had the wrong tires on it and ended up in a very tragic accident. Again, even though that in this particular case, the local church had bought the van and somehow titled it in a way that uh, was pretty strange. The fact that it was all under the ownership and auspices of the conference, the conference now holds the liability for that. We've already touched on hiring of local employees. 
Uh, again, that's uh, been a rather touchy and sensitive issue, I know, in the church of recent days. But the reality is, is that as long as we have the church structure, we have local hires are considered employees of the conference. Uh, Tim mentioned the entering of contracts. I think one of the more egregious cases I saw of this uh, some years back in the church was a local church signed a lease agreement for a photocopy machine. No big deal. Uh, the pastor signed it. He had a parent authority because he was the pastor of the church. They didn't like the photocopier, so they phoned the company and told them to take back their photocopier. The photocopier company never did, and they, the local church stopped paying the lease payments on the photocopier. Uh, a few months later, there was an action by the lease company against the conference, which was the property owner, they said, and, and where the where the lease uh, took effect in the church's property, they were foreclosing on a default judgment that they had gotten against the conference, unbeknownst to the conference, because they had served the local church, the lawsuit, and they were now going to sell another church in the conference, not the one where the photocopier was, but another church in the conference to satisfy the uh, default judgment on that, on that uh, action. Uh, through intervention and through some expensive processes, that was reversed. But nonetheless, that's the kind of thing that can end up. Uh, these, are, these may sound like horror stories, but they're actually true horror stories. Uh, renting property, we've already talked a little bit about that. Uh, my caution on renting local church property is to have the conference involved and have the conference's attorneys looking over those agreements. When I was the legal counsel for the Idaho Conference, and if you're there from Idaho, greetings to you, uh, we worked very carefully to draft a lease agreement so it didn't look like a lease agreement. Uh, because if we had leased the property, Idaho declared that that was a profitable venture and therefore they would lose their property tax. So we drafted a shared use agreement so that Sunday keeping churches could share the use and the expenses of the Adventist church and the courts and the, and the taxation people in Idaho agreed that that would not jeopardize the property tax exemption. And I can assure you if you lose your property tax exemption or some of these other things that happen, the local church usually will come to the conference and say, help, we need some money to bail us out on this. So we are uh, also looking at uh, the use of church-owned property for non-church related activities without proper safeguards. Again, let's say that you've got uh, a soccer league playing on your local church property, great community activity, someone slips and falls, uh, the liability for that slip and fall will probably run straight to the conference and not to the local church. A lot of this falls under the respondeat superior doctrine, which says that liabilities for most employees and volunteer acts that flow uh, out of the course and scope of their duties goes to the employer. So a pastor who spreads false rumors and gets in a defamation suit flows directly back to the conference. The parent who drives a group of pathfinders to event uh, and has an accident the liability will flow back to that conference. The teacher who abuses the student, again, it's an employer. Their acts, even though abusing students isn't in the normal course and scope of employment, if it takes place during the normal course and employment of that person, that act would flow to the conference. And one of the ones that we see from time to time is a church treasurer offering investment advice. Not a good thing to do. And we have numerous cases of church members who have become victims of major scams. I'm not suggesting the conference, uh, the, the church treasurer was the one who is involved in the scam, but he may have been dragged into the scam as well. He advises his friends about what a great investment opportunity this is. And pretty soon the church is the uh, defendant in a lawsuit for the losses that are involved there. Uh, again, all of these things have happened. Let's move quickly now to property insurance and talk a little bit about uh, about where we are on that. Yeah, I hope we've described church structure and we understand the structure in which we work in, and that's that the local church 
can bring liabilities up to the conference level. And I know we've shared some horror stories and some of those things, um, but we want to talk a little bit about the reality that you guys face on the ground. And the reality is, is at a conference level, you purchase a church or a conference-wide insurance program. This can have property insurance, liability insurance, and auto insurance. And when you work with Adventist Risk Management, these programs are designed to cover the conference and all the schools and churches associated with it. Well, one of the questions we often get is the local church has gone out and found coverage through a local insurance company or something like that, and it appears on its face value to be less expensive than the conference program. And it may be less expensive, and there's a lot of reasons it might be, and we'll, we'll describe some of those. But ultimately, when we look at property insurance, we refer to as the, the landowner or the property owner is the conference. And so when we buy an insurance policy, who, is, who has insurable interest in that property? If the church were to burn to the ground, who would be financially affected? Yes, the local church would, but from a true corporate structure standpoint, the conference would be the responsible party. So it's important that when we buy property insurance, that the conference be on that policy as a policyholder. And a lot of times when a local church goes out and buys coverage without that, the conference may be left bare if a, if a, if a fire were to occur or something like that. Um, we've actually received notices from other insurance companies where they have found out and learned about the church structure and have contacted the local church and said, we will no longer be able to write you an insurance policy because you don't have insurable interest in this. We need to write it to the conference level. So when we look at property, we just wanted to run a few things through that can af greatly affect how much the cost of that policy is. Is the coverage actual cash value or replacement? Actual cash value, the definition is the cost to repair or replace the damaged property minus depreciation. This is less expensive coverage because if you have a building that's 40 years old, obviously it has quite high depreciation. So um, you can see how your claim covered amount would be a lot less. Um, when you're when you with Adventist Risk Management, if, you're, if your building um, meets the requirements, you'll have replacement cost coverage. Um, I refer to this as the Cadillac of coverage. It's got a lot of bells and whistles in there that are going to give you code upgrades. Um, you know, a lot of our buildings are older and they may not meet all of the handicap requirements and the elevator requirements. So if something's damaged, we're able to step in and help you with those things. So as your local church goes out and buys, looks for property alternatives, um, it's important you address some of those things. Um, property with the full, with your, with Adventist Risk Management, it's on replacement cost. If you have a building that's valued at $100,000 on the policy and through, you know, inflation and cost of materials and those things, there's an additional 25% coverage there. I can assure you that gets used quite frequently. You can't keep your buildings up to date every single day and take in every cost of a two by four in construction. So, but this is part of our policy. Beware of the exclusions. Uh, that's the most important part of a policy, I say, is, yeah, it's easy to read what's covered, but get into the fine print and find out what's excluded. So um, Bob's going to address liability, but I, I appeal to you to understand that, in my opinion, a local church doesn't have an insurable interest in the property. It is the conference as the owner. So I would, I would, I would argue from the standpoint of a policy can't even be sold to a local church. We'll move on to... Okay, we're going to move on, uh, Tim, but just before we do that, let's stop for a moment. Uh, uh, Dave is telling us we've got some questions. So if they're hard questions, Tim will answer them. If they're easy questions, I'll answer them. Uh, Dave, what do you got here? All right, first question. If a union becomes the payroll center for its conferences, does the union have the liability for the employees? <laughs> I would say the answer to that is no, uh, and I'll tell you why. Even though, for example, if a, a local conference wants to, they could go downtown and contract with a payroll service to do their payroll for them. That payroll company will have no liability other than for their own wrongful acts related to it. For example, if they don't pay somebody or they rip off the money. But they will not be liable for the employees. Similarly, I would advise that if you're going to have a union doing payroll for the conferences, that you have a documentation system for that. Uh, let me give you a good example of that. For example, Adventist Risk Management does all of the work for our captive insurance company, GenCon Insurance Company. 
I happen to be the president of both. Tim happens to be the vice president of both. But we have a very carefully worded service agreement between the two so that we can always show that the liability between those companies does not cross over, but only that Adventist Risk Management is doing certain services for Gen Con. Similarly, if the union's doing the payroll, I would advise the union and the local conference to have an agreement which outlines the duties that the union's doing and if there's any costs or whatever is involved, and then have uh, probably have a good indemnification and hold harmless provision in there for both parties. Uh, most of you have good legal counsel, especially at the union level. I'd suggest you put that in place. It doesn't need to be a 50-page document. You could do it with uh, several pages, but it shows the arm length, the arm's length transaction going on there. All right. Thank you very much. On to the next question, which is, a local entity can enter into contract with a construction company mitigation companies, uh, but what is your recommendation on entering into a contract with a public adjuster? Does it bind the local church or the conference? Uh, excuse me again, who's entering the contract? The, the local church. Well, I think the local church would, if the local church signed, for example, a pastor or whoever, uh, you've got a real complication here because the, the public adjuster may have a contract with the local church, but the local church doesn't have a legal ownership interest in that property. So I would say that what would happen there is likely that the liability for the public adjuster's fees would flow back to the uh, conference through that apparent authority. L let me also add, uh, and we have worked with some churches that have hired public adjusters. And I don't want to sound anti-public adjuster, but public adjusters are generally very helpful if you've got a situation where a claim is being disputed or not being paid. Uh, and, and I hate to say this because, I, you know, uh, I'm in the insurance end of life as well, but some insurance companies will only pay up when they're really forced into that situation. They will look for exclusions or whatever. I would advise you, and I know this sounds a little self-serving, first to admit it, if you're working through Gen Con Insurance Company, the public adjusters that we have had, a church may hire them, they generally end up adding costs to the local church and not resolving the problems. In fact, sometimes they complicate the claim considerably. Let me just tell you how we would handle any claim so that you understand that it's not a case that you're just dealing with somebody in our office at Adventist Risk Management. If your church has a, a significant loss, and that's pretty well any loss other than, you know, you know, some minor little incident that's a few hundred bucks or something, but if you have a significant loss, the first thing we do is we retain an adjuster for the settlement of that claim. That person is not an employee of Adventist Risk Management. They are certified bonded adjusters that we put out to handle that claim and to work with the conference. And they submit all of the information back to us and we pay the claim based on the adjuster statements. So you're kind of getting the benefit of that already. The big difference being is we pay for those adjusters. We do not pay for the public adjuster that you would, uh, you would work with if you hired one. Any other questions? One more, then One we'll move more. on. All right. Thank you for that uh, explanation. All right, this next question is, if a church goes out and gets a quote for property insurance, they say the insurance company can name the conference as additional insured to get around the legal entity issue. How does this work? Does it work? Well, my position on that would be is that they're really insuring the conference at that point in time. Uh, keep in mind that, and I'm going to get into this in liability coverage, it's not enough just to name the conference as the additional insured on the liability coverage either. You have to name all of the entities all the way up. So you have to name the union, you have to name the North American division, and you have to name the general conference. And that's usually where we get the sticking points with the insurers that are trying to uh, be retained by local local entities. Uh, property coverage, you can probably get them to name the local conference. That would be fine. Uh, but 
I'd be a little bit concerned if you have a claim, if they name you as an additional insured to make sure they understand, I still would prefer even for the local church in that case to have the conference named as the full insured party because they have the insurable interest. Yeah, and you have to be very careful because a lot of times an additional insured, if you read the policy, does not have the same rights as the policyholder does. Um, there were a lot of stories out of Katrina where there were people who were leasing grocery stores and things like that in New Orleans, and the, 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 lease, the person who was leasing the building had purchased insurance and named the owner as an additional insured. But when Katrina blew through, the people leasing just left, and the landlord who was an additional insured did not have any right to even file a claim. So it was this, it was an interesting standpoint of they were an additional insured, they thought they were covered, but when it got to the nuts and bolts of the policy, they didn't have a right to file a claim. So they were trying to chase down all these people who had were the named insureds on the policy. So there's a lot of nuance. An additional insured is a good start for a safeguard, but it doesn't guarantee it. Good questions. Thank you very much. We're going to move on to liability insurance at this point, and uh, it's a little more complicated than property. NAD working policy requires three million primary with the higher organizations named as the additional insured, including NAD and GC. So in that case, if a local church went out and tried to buy liability coverage, they'd need to name the conference, they'd need to name the union, they'd need to name the North American division and the general conference. Uh, many insurance companies just don't want to do that. And they don't understand that when they're in, in that scenario, that when they name the additional insured, they're still only going to name them for the purposes of the liability created at the local church. They see this huge organization, the General Conference, the North American Division, they think they're assuming all the liabilities for that organization. Uh, I know we sound a little self-serving, and I apologize for that. Uh, but just for, the, for your information, when you purchase through Gen Con, those organizations are all automatically covered up and down through the, uh, through the, the process. Uh, GC and North American Division Excess provides 22 million excess of the 3 million limits required. So those are in addition, and actually in our overall liability excesses, we insure all the way up to $100 million uh, for you. I would add in here as well, you know, we, I talk about a conference insurance program. And as you know, every Saturday, our churches work together, whether it's sharing Pathfinder, you know, activities or things like those. And what can happen is if one church has an insurance policy with another carrier and the, oh, it's, it's, and the, and the, uh, the rest of the conference is with Adventist Risk Management or another carrier, when it comes to a claim, Who's going to cover the claim? And a lot of times we see this is the two insurance companies will both look at each other and say, not my problem. So I, I really think as an administrator, you need to look at your conference and say, my conference is one entity. I need to look for an insurance program that can work together to cover the activities. Um, things that we've heard, inadequate levels of coverage. A lot of times something happens and someone calls, we thought we had enough. Um, I know you guys have a lot of jobs you do every day, and you know I get to singly every day work on insurance, but when you review policies and we're more than willing to help you at doing it, you got to make sure it's what you need to the best of your ability and to the best of our ability. Wasting limits is a big thing that we've seen. A lot of insurance policies are worded in such a way that, yes, it will say there's $1 million of coverage for one event, and then, oh, there is a $2 million annual policy aggregate. So what that's saying is, in effect, you could have two $1 million claims or a combination of claims that reaches $2 million in one year. As soon as you exceed that threshold, there's no coverage. Um, we have some very real examples of conferences who have run into situations where they had these wasting limits or they had aggregates. And when you get into claims like sexual molestation and these, 10 years later, you find out wow, we didn't have enough coverage and we're in trouble. Or they've combined two coverages on one policy, like a general liability and employment practice sexual molestation, and used all your limits for GL, and then 20 years later, a sexual molestation claim shows up, and you don't have the limits available. Um, we do our best to craft our policies to, to meet your needs in those areas. Who pays for the gap? When it boils down to you know 10 years from now and the limits have been used up and a sexual molestation comes through, Who's going to end up paying for that? Um, you know, clearly the local church probably isn't going to have the money. So I'm going to say that's going to fall on you as in a conference. So 
Today, the decisions that are made today can have long-term effects. You won't necessarily know them for 5, 10, 15 years, but when you work for an insurance program and, and look for protection, you need to think out those many years to make sure you're protecting the future of your conference. We often hear, you know, I start out with uh, that the real challenge you face is a local church comes to you as a conference treasurer and says, I found a better deal. I can save money. I can promise you buying insurance is like buying a car. You get what you pay for. Um, you know, there are car models all over that have different, you know, GPS technology and these things. And insurance is exactly the same way. You may get a great deal, but you got it. The devil's in the details. It's in the fine print. Loss history will predict pricing. Um, you know, the mechanism of insurance is spreading the risk. And at a conference level, a local church may have a $500,000 loss and the conference may only see a, you know, 10 or 15 percent increase. But if a local church and we've seen this happen, had a $500,000 loss and they were with one single carrier by themselves, they just get canceled. Um, and that can be that can create gaps down the thing. Many policy have strict limitations on sexual molestation coverage. Guys, you and I know we're a religious organization. We know this is a liability and exposure that is well noted in the news and is very it's very difficult for insurance companies to cover. So they are very good at crafting the language on the policy so that it's really not going to cover a lot. Um, changing back and forth creates risk for the church. Um, the details are, again, in, the, in the, the devil of this. You'll hear the term occurrence policy, and briefly... I'm going to talk about that here. Okay. Well, but before we do, before we move on, Dave says he's got a, a great question for us. I do have a good question here. All right. Thank you. Uh, question is, has ARM ever had to pay out on the excess liability policy over the $3 million that is required if purchasing insurance outside of ARM? Insurance reps from the other companies say it is overkill that the church requires. I can assure you we have paid much more than the excess coverage many times. Uh, in fact, in the last uh, six months, I think, we have paid two major claims, which, to be honest with you, you think, well, that's not a big claim. Uh, but all you need to do is have a death or a disabling uh, situation, which we have done, and we have paid claims in excess of multiple millions of dollars. Uh, uh, one claim in the last six months we paid out in excess of ten million dollars, uh, so I would say, yeah, this is this is no longer hypothetical. These excess coverages, these excess coverages, are there for very important use, and you know, it, it's easy to say if you look simply at a local congregational set of activities that oh, what's going to happen? There's not going to be that much, but keep in mind that even sexual molestation cases now in different jurisdictions are settling well over a million dollars a piece. Uh, so the, the litigation costs on top of that, keep in mind, you may find that the litigation costs, if you really are going to try to defend some of these cases, will be uh, 500000 to a million dollars. We have some, we have a case right now that has legal expenses in excess of a million dollars. It's unfortunate, but you can't control some of that stuff because the other side may be doing things that just require you to spend an awful lot of money uh, to get the get the resolution you need. Again, I'm not an attorney, so but I, I you know there's this misconception. I hear this a lot of well, the 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 attorney will ask for the policy limits and they'll see that you have ten million dollars and that's what the demand will be. Um, I can assure you that if this goes to court and the jury or the judge is sitting there, they don't really care how much insurance they have. They're going to look at your assets of your organization, and those are liable to it as well. So it's not – there's this misconception that high limits lead to high, high cases. and That's just not the, the – the evidence is not there. Yeah, I tell you, if, if I personally – and I, I carry a personal uh, excess policy myself – I don't worry about the fact that I might have too much insurance, but my concern is today is that if you get in a situation that you're not going to have adequate insurance and the excess policies that the church provides are there for a very good reason. And uh, as Tim suggested, for example, if you get into a punitive damage situation, which often comes up in discussion in sexual molestation cases, those they don't look at 
just the assets of the of the uh, of the local church. They'll look at the assets of the entire conference. So let's take a look at this occurrence versus claims made. This is something that is can be very complicated. I'm going to try to make it very simple as much as I can anyway. Uh, occurrence forms of coverage, those are for losses during a given period of time. And 99.9% and .9 of the time, it's the policy period. The loss can be reported years later, but the key is when, when it happened. So let's say, for example, uh, and I'll give you an example here in a minute. Let me just describe claims made. The claims made policy uh, is not so concerned about when the occurrence happened, but rather when the claim was actually made or the actual uh, period of time it was given in. So you could actually buy a sexual molestation or a liability claims package that says you have an occurrence coverage for, the, for your, your period of time of January 1 to December 31. And let's take a look at this example. So on January 1, we're looking at a sexual molestation. On January 1, 2012, uh, the church in, uh, changes its insurers to one that offers limited occurrence coverage for sexual molestation. This is not unusual. Uh, they either will offer the limited occurrence or limited uh, claims made. They do not buy a tail for coverage for past incidents. The tail is simply, it says, is that okay, we now have p coverage under this new policy. They would have coverage for any occurrence that took place from January 1, 2012 to, Janu to December 31, 2012. So let's say on July 1, a claim is filed for sexual molestation that allegedly took place on July 1, 2011, when they were covered with ARM. ARM is covered with uh, claims made, which is a standard way to cover sexual molestation. Uh, you could have this with two outside insurance companies as well. I've seen it happen. So, claim is made on July 1, 2012 for something that happened on July 1, 2011. Your current insurance policy that you bought from XYZ Insurance Company will not cover it because it's occurrence. The occurrence did not take place during the time of their coverage. The claims made coverage that you had formerly won't cover it because the claim is now made in 2012, not in 2011, when you had the claims made coverage. Unless you buy the tail, which would then take you back for so many years, and in the case of sexual molestation, you need to go back a long way because more and more jurisdictions are either saying we're not going to have a statute of limitations on sexual molestation or we're going to open it up for an extended period of time, 30, 40 years. So in this case, there's no coverage. Now, you say, well, that that probably won't happen. We've seen it happen. I've seen it happen in the last few years where a uh, conference has gone in and out of coverage with different insurers and they call me and say, surely we have coverage for this, <coughs> excuse me, not so much from, from ARM, but from their previous insurer. And we take a look at it and lo and behold, they have no coverage. Uh, we had a situation here where uh, a conference that shall remain nameless had gone had its insurance from an outside carrier. Uh, the the policy that they had switched over a couple of times during this period uh, was was creating a gap in this coverage such as this. And they also had aggregates that Tim described earlier of a of a million dollars aggregate on sexual molestation. And out of one person one in, one person they had several claims. And they didn't have coverage for the, uh, in the one year because of the aggregate. And they didn't have the coverage for another incident because it wasn't. It was during this gap period. The, the suggestion I make here, and I'm and and we mean this sincerely. Our first role is to assist you as risk managers. Our role, yeah, we sell insurance from the standpoint of Gen Con, but we're not here as insurance providers only. We are your risk managers. If you are looking at going to another carrier, or if you're at another carrier now, or if you have a local church that wants to do this, we are very happy to review that policy for you in a very objective way. You don't need to give us the premiums or anything else, but let us at least give you the advice that you need to make sure that you don't get caught in one of these gap situations. 
Yeah, I think Bob has covered very well the, the claims made versus occurrence. And as we said, most insurers do, do provide this on an employment or on, on a claims made basis only. And that's okay. But the key is to make sure that the dates all match up. And when you switch back and forth between insurers, that can become very hard to follow. And so it's important to do that. And I'll, I'll skip to the third bullet point there. When you stay with one carrier, and such as ARM or any other carrier, you get that consistency of coverage. And what a claims made policy allows us to do, and if, if you're with Avenus Risk Management and you were to go pull your policy, most of you are going to see a retroactive date of the 1994 to 1995 level, and that's where we made a switch in insurance. But if you were to go back and look at those first policies, the limits and some of the language would not meet today's legal environment. So what a claims made policy allows us to do, and when you're with one carrier, is we're able to adjust limits. You know, as Bob said, states are opening up the statute of limits or limitations. Uh, you need higher limits. You need, there's different employment laws. We're able to change our policy, and it actually goes back and provides that coverage all the way back to 1994 or 95 or one of your retroactive data. So it's this idea that you get this policy, it provides continuous coverage, and we do our best, as Bob said, as risk manager of the church, to keep our policy accurate and in compliance with the today's challenges we face. One of the, if I could just add here, Tim, one of the big problems that I see happening today, if you look back, and the reason why we have a retroactive date to the 1990s is that's when we formed our insurance company, so we can't go further than that. But the reality is, is that I, I have seen, and one of the things I caution you is, never throw away your insurance policies. We have seen conferences very recently that are scrambling to find insurance policies from the 1970s because of newly opened statute of limitations. This is very challenging for them. We will do everything we can to help them because uh, these insurance policies were issued by commercial uh, carriers at that time. And, uh, and unfortunately, even if you do find them, you might find in a 1970 policy that you had really good coverage for 1970 for sexual molestation, $250,000 that will not even cover your legal defense fees anymore. I, I, I tell you that because it's just the reality, but keep in mind, keep your policies and always, if you can, try to keep this gap from, from, from coming back to bite you later. Okay, another area that we need to look at real quickly before we wrap up. Different insurers for local church and local conference can lead to adversarial roles between the church and the conference and disputed claim process. Again, we've seen this happen where you have a, an insurance company that may have property coverage for the local church, uh, and then you've got a, who's a different carrier than what the conference is using, whether that's ARM or some other carrier. And oftentimes this creates an adversarial role that Tim suggested where both sit and point the finger at the other and say, oh, by the way, ours is only for excess over your coverage because you should be the primary on here and vice versa. They'll point back and forth. And pretty soon the way you resolve this dispute is you go to court and sue both of them. And if you think that's a strange position to be in, we've seen this happen now in conferences where they have not been able to get their claims settled by the insurance company. Thankfully, I will tell you this, it's not ARM. And they have had to, we've advised them, file a lawsuit against the insurance company so you can get the claim settled. Uh, so they go out and spend another couple hundred thousand dollars filing the lawsuit to try to get the, the uh, claim settled. Uh, claims handling by some insurers will also aggravate church members and those in the community. Subrogation can be very challenging. If you insure by most insurers, they will want to subrogate the claim, for example, if you have another cause involved in the incident. Let me give you a hypothetical that's really not much of a hypothetical. It's really kind of from our files that we've seen this happen. Let's say, for example, the local church has its insurance company with XYZ for coverage. And let's say that the church burns down and it's discovered that the reason the church burns down is because they had a contractor in there who was doing something that created a flammable situation and caused the fire. And then, lo and behold, the contractor that was in there wasn't getting paid at all. He was the local church elder 
who had volunteered to bring his construction company onto the site to do the construction work that needed to be done, and he did it as a donation to the local church. And even though he was a commercial contractor, uh, you know, he doesn't want to pay this for this fire because he was there as a volunteer. That, I can tell you what will happen with most insurance companies. They will file a lawsuit against that person. They don't care whether he's the head elder, whether he's a layman, whether he was there free of charge or not. If they can find somebody else that will pay the claim, they will go after the contractor or the volunteer in this case. Next time you need your roof repaired, I suggest that you would not want to call that layman to come out to the site after he's been sued and had to pay that claim. Uh, we have taken the position in Adventist Risk Management to walk on those eggshells very carefully and not to break those eggshells. And so we generally will not go after somebody who is a volunteer in that capacity who really is maybe negligent, but certainly didn't go in and burn the church down on purpose. If they burn the church down on purpose, we may all work together to go after the person. But you have to be very careful because the relationships in the Adventist church are very easily destroyed through incidents like this, and they take a long time to build and even longer to rebuild. One of the things that comes up in our discussions is the premium allocation. And Tim, touch on that and tell me why why is this a problem for a local church? Yeah, definitely. You know, we we provide policies to you that are at the conference level, and most of them will will list the local churches and schools, and will have premiums there and things. and And this is an area where we want to partner with you. We realize this is kind of where the rubber meets the road. Is what is a local church going to pay for insurance? And as I worked with different conferences and and things around, we've I've seen different ways that people do it, and. I will, do, I will give you my recommendations based on kind of what exposures a local church has, and then you're going to have to use your judgment and kind of what your, your internal policies are. But when it comes to property insurance, yes, we've said that the conference owns the property, but I think this is an insurance policy that you can allocate down to the local church or school because they are the ones operating in there and that can fit within their budget. Um, but this is an area where you need to work carefully with us. We can provide you different allocation methods. Um, we can we can show you what churches and schools have had losses and try and work through that with you. Um, general liability on the primary level, again, I think that can be pushed down or allocated down to a, a local church. But you need to be careful. I mean, if, if, if a local church doesn't have a climbing wall, you can't charge them for, you know, climbing wall insurance. It's on the GL. You got to charge, and the GL is a very, it's, it's again, based on their exposure. So when you look at the schedule, you're going to see the square footage of their building, and you're going to see what the allocated or the charge premium should be. Um, in my opinion, employment practices and sexual molestation liability should not be passed down to the local church. Um, the, the, the conference is the employer of the, the employees. So the local church really would have no liability for, you know, the pastor's wrongdoings or things like that or the, the volunteers. The sexual molestation part of it, yeah, that hap could happen at the local church. But again, to me, this is one that you as an organization should take on at the conference level. One man's opinion. Um, but this gets down to for especially general liability and employment practices, as Bob said, it's a lot more complicated. You at the conference are going to be named in the lawsuit. So you got to be decide very carefully of how much of this is protecting you at the conference level versus the, the ch local church level. Excess liability, you know, depending on where this picks in, to me, this is really to protect you, the higher organization in this. You are the legal owner. Uh, if a big lawsuit comes through, I, I think you as treasurers and administration need to, to budget accordingly and pay this out of your local uh, or out of your budget. Um, if a local church goes to another insurance company, unless they're really savvy and they're going to get a you know a hundred million dollars from that local insurance company, um, it's not something that would normally happen there. Another thing that we've run into that's caused us, you know, and this again sounds a little self-serving, but it causes us to look like we're not competitive in the market. Is um, I've I've had multiple conferences who add on 10, 15 percent processing fees to the insurance premium they're passing down to their local churches. So the, and the, and they and in the cases I've had, they're not disclosing this to the local church. 
So the local church gets a bill for $1,000, which includes a 10% processing fee from the conference, takes that out to another carrier, and the other carrier can instantly probably be 10% less. Um, these are the things that we want to partner with you on, and we're willing to work a, a lot of different ways on allocation, but we need, to, we need to partner with you and make sure the correct premiums are getting passed down to the local church. You know, it's interesting, Tim. We had a, a large... Uh fairly affluent church come to us who had actually taken their insurance to the local market and had purchased local coverage in that market. And the finance committee chairman contacted us and wanted to bring the church back into Gen Con insurance. Uh, we set about putting together the pricing for that and in doing so, we took it to the conference, obviously. we we can't quote directly to the local church because that would not be appropriate. But we told the conference what we wanted to do, and the conference was uh, was uh, saying to us, well, wait a minute, you can't take that price for that church to that church because we, we don't charge that. We charge a lot more than that to that local church if we put it through you because that's a large church. It's an affluent church. They can afford a lot more than some of our small churches. So we raise their insurance bill to offset some of the smaller churches. Well, it was pretty clear to us then why the conference was having problems with this church and that they had gone to the local market. And uh, we kind of quietly backed off and we did not get that church insured, which I think was kind of ironic because they didn't get the extra boost for the conference insurance either that way. So uh, those are just some of the frustrations that we see. And we also understand, though, that the frustrations are at the conference level as they try to balance budgets and help out little churches that don't have the, uh, the, financial, uh, the financial strength. Uh, again, and we're wrapping up now, uh, I want to thank you for your continued interest and support in our programs. Uh, whether you buy insurance from Gen Con or wherever, let us help you. Uh, if you've got policies you'd like us to review, if you've got questions on any of these kinds of issues, uh, feel free to give us a call. Uh, Tim Northrup is our VP of insurance. I know that he'll be happy to look over the policies himself or get somebody who can do that for you. But if any of us can be of assistance to you, that's what we're here for. And remember that our ministry at ARM is to protect your ministry. Thank you.